This is Residence 104.4 FM. Flipping marvellous. How are you? Tis I, Nick Hennigan, coming at you once more with a slice of, well, literature in London on Literary London. I hope you're well. Are you? Good. Um, and I thought we'd carry on uh, an interview that you may have heard in the last show where I was talking to Sally Fiber. Now, Sally Fiber was born in a pub called the Fitzroy Tavern in Fitzrovia on Charlotte Street, the corner of Charlotte Street and Windmill Street, a pub I know very well because it was in that very pub in what was the Writers and Artists Bar downstairs. It's now the toilets, perhaps appropriately. But anyway, uh, I was down there, ooh, 2010 and 2011 and saw pictures of all these incredible writers and artists on the wall. And it was that one visit uh, that made me write the London Literary Pub Crawl, which is still going strong today. In fact, getting stronger and stronger after lockdown. Um, and I had the the fortune, the good fortune, to come across Sally Fiber, who was born as a child in the Fitzroy Tavern uh, after the Second World War. And she was telling stories of Walter Sickett, Augustus John, and then later on Dylan Thomas, or so I say earlier on Dylan Thomas, uh, Nina Hamlet, various artists, um, bohemians whose names are now known around the world, who used to congregate there. And she's written a book. The book is still in print. It's called The Fitzroy Tavern, The History of a London Pub. Her name is Sally Fiber. Uh, sadly, she passed away uh, a few years ago, but uh, she was a lovely woman, as you're going to hear now. So... This is part two, the history of a London pub. Um, and her father, Pop Kleinfeld, was uh, very famous for years and years. The term Fitzrovia actually arguably came from him talking about his Fitzrovians, the people that would go to the Fitzroy Tavern. Um, but apparently Sally's mother wasn't too keen on going into the pub trade to start with. Oh no, she didn't want to. Her, I mean, her... Her ideals, because she left school quite early at, at 15, and she'd done very well at school. She was going to go on to the Burlington College and then to finishing school in uh, Switzerland. But my grandfather, you know, and she, she just in the end gave in, and who wanted to go into a horrible pub? <laughs> she didn't want to do it at all. She did finish up by saying it was probably the best finishing school that anyone could ever go to. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and how did she meet your father? Ah, very interesting. <laughs> she, she really met him because my grandfather used to organise trips out to Epsom to the Derby. And uh, he used to organise a ch charabang with the men going and this nice man called Charlie, Charlie Allchild, used to drive the motor coaches. Like, unlike his uh, brothers, who were all tailors, he was different. He was a motor mechanic. And he took a shine as the barber in Windmill Street, Alf Fagan, told me, uh, to Charlie. And he thought Charlie was a nice man. So when my mother used to take some ladies, and of course there weren't very many ladies, it was just a little limousine that they took. They specially asked Charlie to drive the coat, uh, the, the limousine to the, the Derby as well. And that's how they first met. And my grandfather said he had to find a man who, who not only would be a, a wonderful husband for his daughter, but would also be the right sort of personality to take over, hopefully, to the tavern from him as well one day and that's how they met and I only knew this because of the barber in Wilmer Street who is one of the people I uh, interviewed for um, a project which came up during the time I was writing the book because I wanted to know more about my grandfather's roots and so we started doing a project to record the history of the Jewish people who lived in the West End of London as against the East End where most of the immigrants first came and uh, it, it proved to be a most fascinating and wonderful project um, quite an eye-opener <laughs> in what in what way well or in what ways Jim? in in the way that um, nobody really really realised that there was such a, a large community. I mean, when I say large, it, it was in the 20s and 30s, something like 25,000 
Jewish people living in, in the West End of London and working, um, compared with the East End, which probably was over 100,000. So although uh, it, it was comparatively a smaller community, it was a very, very vibrant community. And we called the project Living Up West because where you research most areas, it's just the people and the, the people surrounding that area you work on. This time, many of the people came up west to seek out the parks and the museums and the theatres and everything that the West End had to offer. So they made up part of the story as well as the, the actual people living and working in, in around that area. We, ha we had to define the area of London we were doing and also the time uh, scale from really 1850 to after the Second World War. And it was a wonderful, wonderful project which still goes on today. <laughs> I'm still learning and, and, and hearing more stories and it's, it's wonderful. We did this under the auspices of the London Jewish Museum if anyone ever wanted to go there, it, it's in Camden, and uh, it's it's a very fascinating place to visit. Yes, because I mean, there's such a, 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 a the East End of London has always been sort of home to the to the incomers, if you like, <laughs> to to the UK. Uh, so presumably, the, the living up west were, were the Jewish communities that had arrived initially in East London, had they, and then moved west, or had they? Uh, some of them had arrived. Many of them arrived. <coughs> but, uh, sort of Seven Dials area, um, the cheaper areas, they lived around Berwick Street, Berwick Street Market, that's where my husband's family came from. They all came from, from you might say, the south side of Oxford Street. And we were the north side and sometimes the people in the north, or at least the, the south, wouldn't talk to the north, they thought they were posh. <laughs> Which ones were posh? Sorry, I laughed over that. <laughs> they were. They were, I suppose, comparatively in the early days, but after it seemed to smooth itself out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Great Divide is Oxford Street. It Center. was the Great Divide. <laughs> right. I mean, and what was very interesting is uh, the, there was the uh, Westminster Jewish Free School in Hanway Place, just off Tottenham Court Road. But many of the people who lived in the Soho side felt that it was too dangerous to send your children to school because of the traffic in Oxford Street. <laughs> so they chose schools who lived in, in the Soho side um, and wouldn't trust their children crossing that. Oxford Street with all the traffic. <laughs> they might have a point, actually. <laughs> Mind you, I suppose it's a bit calmer now, isn't it? <laughs> That's fascinating stuff. And just say, where, where is the museum again? Uh, the museum is in Albert uh, Road um, in Camden. Yes. Okay. It's brilliant. And, I, and I, the whole notion of in, immigration. As I say, I've only been in London myself full time for, what, five, six years. And it's, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm quite pleased I can see it with open eyes having come all the way from Birmingham you know 120 <laughs> miles man and boy so uh, we're talking about the Fitzroy uh, uh, Fitzroy Tavern specifically in Fitzroy with Sally Fiber who was born there let's just go back a little bit to the um, so so your mother and father married uh, and so was it expected that they would take over the running of the pub because uh, that seems to have happened to a few pubs that I know of in, in the London area I think so. I think I think it was sort of it seemed to be a natural sort of uh, thing that, as my mother had been there, I suppose that that um, and and my grandfather, you know, especially chose uh, and, and, and hoped that that her husband would be the right man to take over, and he certainly proved it because he was wonderful, and he carried on all the um, all the things that. My grandfather had started, for instance, the collection of First and Second World War memorabilia, which became a great feature of the pub. 
Yeah. I've seen some of the photographs. They, they, they're quite impressive. And some of the characters pre-war, I suppose, would that have included... Uh, uh, just, I'm thinking of Dylan Thomas would have been around then, perhaps. Augustus John. Have you got any, any memories or stories, family stories about them? Or, or Nina Hamlet, indeed, who is a character, I gather. Well, Nina Hamlet was a great, great character. She, she, she was lovely. And, of course, uh, Augustus John, in his autobiography, Finishing Touches, explains the day where he, he first met Dylan Thomas in the pub. Uh, he was, uh, suddenly heard this wonderful Welsh voice coming over and his friend said, that's Dylan Thomas. And she was, he was sitting there with Nina and uh, some other people, William Epston, who was also at that time one of the lively crit critics and poets of that time, himself described as a great genius. And so he was introduced and, uh, uh, um, sorry, Augustus John then decided that he would buy them all a drink. Well, he used to drink double rum and brandy in the bar. <laughs> but he said that all this, all the Dylan Thomas and his friends were all drinking beer. So he decided on this occasion he would drink a beer and join them. <laughs> And that's how they first met. And he said um, that he he would love to meet Dylan Thomas during the day. They often played Shove Hate Me, which my grandfather had put in the barn by now. And uh, he said during the day he was wonderful. During the night he was a different man. He didn't want to know him. Often my mother would have to throw Dylan Thomas out because he was just just not the same person once he had a few drinks inside him um, and um, you know this is this is how how the, the, the uh, sort of atmosphere of the pub uh, was at that time and they were pretty strict people did remember throwing people out <laughs> uh, I suppose the good thing about that, though, he was allowed in again to be thrown out once more. Oh, he, oh yes, he was allowed. Well, during the day, you see, he was he, he was a great um, character, um, quite a, quite a, a personality, and it's very interesting that when I was writing the book, somebody um, contacted me, and it was actually his daughter, Aroni. Oh. She bought my book. She was writing her father's memoirs and she wanted to find out as much as she could about her father. And we, she, she became very despondent in writing. She, believe it or not, she couldn't find a publisher. Oh, blimey. <laughs> writing. And so Shive Carl Williams, who is my co-author, and I, we, we met her, we suggested meeting her during one of the Fitzrovia festivals. And she came up with her husband a lovely vivacious lady full of life and uh, we, we had many conversations we encouraged her to go on with the book which was eventually published and then one day I was listening to Woman's Hour and they were serializing her book called My Father's Places and the sad thing was they announced that the book had been published three weeks um, before she died, no, after she died, after she died, just three weeks, uh, she died of leukemia, which was really sad. But in the book, she, she wrote uh, some lovely things about uh, the pub and the generosity of my parents. And um, you know, I found that was so sad that she was never there to see the book herself. Yes, yes, it is. I, I actually met Trevor, her husband, uh, and I spoke, in fact, on the uh, on this show. Uh, Hannah Ellis, who is uh, her daughter, uh, is working very hard to keep yes. Dylan's his, uh, Dylan's kind of um, uh, you know flag flying, which is great. Yes, and Trevor yes. was a lovely. And it, this was uh, a year or so ago, so she's been. I know she passed away a few years back. And as I was talking to Trevor, I could see his eyes filling up ever so slightly. So I changed the subject, but it just I, which so sort of moved me a little bit because it was a, it was a fairly public event. You know, it was the launch of the Dylan Thomas and Vitrovia Festival. I didn't really know who he was, and we started to talk about it. And, and the warmth with which he spoke. I mean, you'd expect that anyway, wouldn't you? husband talking about about the wife, but he was uh, he was genuinely moved. I, I found that quite moving as well. 
Uh, and we, we drank a bit and sang some songs. All was well after that, I suppose. Yeah. But it's a lovely story. And, uh, and who else? Nina Hamnick. Tell us a bit about Nina Hamnick, because she's perhaps one of the lesser known, uh, uh, you know, to the general public, lesser known artists who used to be a regular at the Fitzroy Tavern. Yes, well, she was a great artist, and she, she used to... Um, take over and, and she herself was immortalized by many of these people like Epstein and um, and um, many many affairs like in fact Betty May she was a great rival of Betty May's um, <laughs> Betty May who is you know the tiger woman who now is going to be immortalized in a musical why was she called tiger woman she was called tiger woman because she had um, really a very fiery temperament and uh, quite a personality. And in fact, Jacob Epstein tried to, to tame this, uh, uh, sort of uh, control her, her temperament. Um, and this is really why she became known as Tiger Woman because of this. Uh, she. she if she got in the pub with um, Betty May, who was also immortalised and and and, um, and portrayed by particularly Epstein, um, my mother used to say, "Oh, we're going to have fireworks tonight because of such rivalry between them." And uh, Betty May was actually five years older than Nina, but uh, they were great. They were rivals, but they were also great friends, <laughs> if you know which I mean. There was uh, something between them. And um, they, they were both, it was Nina actually, who, who said to my mother, you know, you've got a lot of famous people coming into the tavern. Have you got an autograph book? And my mother said no. So she actually bought her an autograph book. And in there, between 1927 and 31, there were 90 entries of uh, poems, uh, pictures, music, because we had lots of uh, musicians like um, uh, Constant Lambert, who used to come in and play on a pianola that my grandfather had put in. He wanted something to liven up the pub. And he put in this electric pianola to make it play. You had to put a penny in the slot. And my mother said it was a wonderful piece of furniture, she used to call it, with lamps with little shades on and little bobbles on the shades. <laughs> and every day he used to come in and play. And one day she plucked up courage to go and say, who are you? Why, why do you play all this music? And he said, I'm Constant Lambert, the composer. And um, he, he wrote in the book, there were other people who, who signed their names, uh, like Peter Warlock, and um, just trying to... Um, Can we think of some of the, the other names? I love the fact there was a little complaint. Yeah. There was a complaint in the book. The only one complaint, it says in your book, the only complaint in the, in the visitor's book was, uh, it says, whether I come at night or noon, I have only one complaint, it's always time too soon. Yes, that's nice. right, that's right, yes. That was a lovely write-up um, by one of them. And of course, there's the other lovely write-up um, of Professor Haldein, um, which is in the book, which uh, says, On entering Mr. Kleinfield's portal, one may well find oneself immortal, but it I only have to whistle to have my portrait done by Bissell. If he doesn't do me justice, I take a sitting with Augustus. If I prefer my artist heavy, then I'll ooze around and sit with Levy. Whilst if I like them somewhat leaner, I'll take run away and pose with Nina. <laughs> my fizz will decorate the Louvre, the Prado and the Tate. I think that's lovely. <laughs> it is, isn't it? All the characters. <laughs> There's another one here which I'll read as well. It's from, uh, it's a two-liner from Patrick Kerwin in 
February 1929, would you believe? He wrote, Annex to the Temple of the Muse, Muses, sorry. Annex to the <laughs> Temple of the Muses, where musing done, the poet boozes. Yes. <laughs> Sums up the Bohemian thing. So, fascinated. What, what happened to the book? Have you still got the book, presumably, the autograph book? Oh, yes, I have. Yes, indeed. It's, it's, it must be a very, very prized thing today. And I also have, with, with the, with the um, charity, the, the Pennies from Heaven charity, my mother used to get everybody, all the customers involved, including, including Augustus John. But the year that he couldn't come, I, I still have his original letter saying he's sorry he couldn't come. He was finishing the portrait of somebody and he had to do it. Uh, I don't know who the portrait was of, but that, that, that I would love to know who he was doing it of. But he sent a contribution to the Fitzroy Fund and he finished the letter, all the best and plenty of muzzle. And that's a Jewish word for luck. And uh, this is one he picked up from my grandfather, which he always used to use in his letters from that time. And uh, also we've got pictures of Betty May. She used to go out helping the children on the coaches before the war. And many, many other of the famous people all used to come and help. And um, it was absolutely tremendous. The first year that I went, I was three months old. My parents, having at last taken their baby, because the uh, outing started in 1923, and now the excitement of having their own baby, I was told by one of the people we interviewed for the West End project, that that year all the children were asked to sing the song, Sally, Sally, <laughs> and I didn't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> cool as ever. <laughs> it's quite funny, but I learned so much about what happened by interviewing all these over a hundred people we interviewed. Oh, brilliant! It's so important to to sort of get those reminiscences, isn't it? I mean, not just for a book, but for for society generally. I'm a great a great exactly. fan of that. So uh, the war came. And you were you were you were sent away, weren't you? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, take put put put, put into safety. I was put into safety. My father bought a, a, a property in uh, Somerset, and that's where I used to go with my nanny. Yes. And I gather the uh, the pub actually did its bit for the war, and and they your parents decided not only were they going to stay in London, but they were going to stay open. They were going to stay, and they felt it was one of the, the pub. One of the few things that people could go to was to go to a pub during the war and they wanted to keep open and they were determined to keep open and the first thing my grand oh, hello. My father wanted to do, um, he wanted to buy a ship's bell uh, and he found out, hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? Right. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, it's a bit of a bad line. C carry on, yes. Yeah, so, um, we'll talk, well, talk about that? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the ship's bell was from a ship called HMS Fitz, Fitzroy, which was in an American shipyard and about to be broken up. And when war was declared, they decided to bring this destroyer back into the war as one of the fourth of, of ships that were going to cross the channel take people back and forth across the channel and um, it, it was amazing because it did I think 27 trips across the channel and then one day um, they received a telegram that the ship had been uh, torpedoed and absolutely devastated and then a couple of days later they got another telegram and if you got a telegram in the war that was bad news. But this was good news, that all the ship's company had, had been saved. If the ship had been scuttled on very shallow water, they'd been instructed by the captain to save the nameplate of the ship and the white ensign. And they wanted to come back to the pub to celebrate. And they came back with the other ships, of two other ships from the flotilla and the excitement that night was amazing. Ship, 
obviously drinks all round on the house and they presented the um, name plate and the flag for the tavern and also they took off their cap tallies and this started a wonderful collection of naval cap tallies in the pub as well. So uh, it, it, it was really a wonderful thing and then after that they heard that an American Liberty ship was given the name Fitzroy and so they adopted that ship and you, my mother used to collect uh, books and games and they used to sit in the bar. My mother used to supply the special oiled wool and they had a little group of people who used to sit in the bar including somebody called James Norbury who was worked for Patton and Baldwin and he was the historian of the company and he was a great influence at that time on the pub and uh, you know he wrote some wonderful things about the pub as many many others did too and uh, it was really that's how Tom Dryberg originally found out about the pub and it was from that meeting that he wrote the article about Fitzrovia. And the name has stuck ever since. The rest, as they say, stuck. is history. It's definitely stuck. It's a very <laughs> proud area of London now. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I'm Nick Hennigan. This is uh, Literary London on 104.4 FM, talking to Sally Fiber, author of a book, uh, uh, the book called The Fitzroy, which is the um, uh, the autobiography of a London tavern. Um, Oh, we can't get cracking, I could be here forever. But So let's move on. Uh, I like the fact, in a sense, in, in your book, uh, chapter five is called Murder Most Foul. So although it's very positive and, and up, uplifting, and I didn't realise that the last, uh, was it Hangman in England, Albert, was it Albert Pierce Point? Al Albert Pierpont. Albert yeah. Pierpont. Lovely Albert Pierpont. I say, he sounded like a lovely bloke. He was lovely. He was lovely. I used to sit on his, he was the first the public executioner. And he used to come into the pub when he was on his uh, special commissions uh, to London and he used to pop into the pub and then one day he came down and he saw somebody lying in the gutter and the people round and it turned out to be the Antichrist murder and uh, he didn't realise at the time what it was, he walked on, he just thought there'd been an accident and of course, eventually, um, they found out that this uh, man who had children, was very well known in the area, had been uh, killed uh, by people who were uh, uh, burglaring one of the shops, the, the jewellery shops in, in Fitzrovia. And uh, eventually, Pierpont, they set up the Fitzroy as the headquarters for the case. Among them was Bob Fabian, who I knew very, very well. He came to my wedding. Uh, there was uh, three or four other detectives there as well. And um, Pierpont, you know, used to come in and uh, that's eventually, of course, he hung the, the people, but he was against hanging. He, he, didn't, he didn't approve of hanging, but that was his job. It was he took took it over from his father, and he he was an amazing man. He used to come up to the pub and sit me on on his knee in the sitting room, and we used to sing nursery rhymes together. <laughs> he loved children. He never had children on his own. Um, when we had the children's parties in the St Pancras Town Hall after the war for five hundred and four children. Only the helpers and the sea scouts who Ralph Reader used to bring along were allowed to help. And so he came and we everyone called him Uncle Albert. He was jolly, he loved to chat with the children. Children didn't know who he was at all. They just knew him as Uncle Albert. Fascinating stories. Thank you very much to Sally Fiber, the late Sally Fiber. Her book is still available. Uh, if you want to know more, then again, get in touch with me. Radio at 
mavericktheatre.co.uk is the easiest way radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk and that's all we've got time for you can hear the whole thing on bohemianbritain.com the interview from 2015 and have a great time I'll see you when next we meet this is Resonance 104.4 FM <laughs>